No worries. Okay, awesome. And we are now live. Welcome everyone to Monday Meets, the Willow Weekly series where we talk to staff, partners, uh, other agencies, anyone we want to spend a little time with um, about their programs, what they do, and who they are. It's an informal chat session. If you have any questions um, for our guests today at any time, you can leave those in the comment section. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable leaving a question, you prefer to do it anonymously, I will put my email down in the comments, and you can feel free to email me, and I can work that in. If you're watching a recording of this, but you'd still like to know something, we'd be happy to uh, go ahead and, and answer that for you. Uh, I'll leave my email in the YouTube link as well. So we'll have all that taken care of. Um, very excited today. This is a, a conversation that we were actually supposed to have a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately um, I had some health problems around my way. So thank you both for being super flexible. Yeah, no problem. We were in Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So this is sort of a, a conversation about the intersection between the Willow and uh, Kansas Suicide Prevention Headquarters on where we kind of, how we work together um, in relationship to human trafficking and um, mental health issues in the Human Trafficking Task Force here in town. So I would love it if you guys could just take a moment and introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about how you got into the, uh, the Kansas Suicide Prevention Headquarters game. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Erica Mould and uh, I, actually started at KSPHQ as a volunteer in 2014. Um, and so, so as a volunteer, I was answering the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, and was a volunteer for a couple of years and have been just kind of around at KSPHQ in various capacities. Um, and I'm now the, the Zero Suicide Program Coordinator um, for our resource center. And uh, I got into this work primarily because of my own lived experience as a suicide attempt survivor um, and, and also just caring a lot about people who have been suicidal in the past or have attempted suicide, um, et cetera. So very near and dear to my heart. And my name is Jared Otten and I'm the crisis line coordinator at KSPHQ. And like Erica, I was a volunteer. So I went through volunteer training in the spring of 2013 and um, have also been around ever since in some capacity. And um, I was hired at HQ in, I guess, 2020. So uh, January of 2020. So I've been here two years. Um, fun fact is I also was an, a student intern at the Willow. Uh, and so I was working um, with the human trafficking team, um, providing support to survivors in the community and um, in the jail setting. So um, that experience was pretty incredible. And so maybe I'll get to reflect on that a little bit today. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, so let me ask you this. I mean, I, I was a little, uh, as, uh, as someone who doesn't kind of regularly connect with you all, um, I was a little bit, um, surprised that, 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 uh, KSPHQ was, um, part of the human trafficking task force, just because the Venn diagram between trafficking and suicide prevention doesn't immediately kind of seem like it would it would connect. Um, can we start by just talking a little bit about your programs and how those sort of relate to trafficking? Yeah, I might start on the um, counseling side of things and then have Erica um, fill you in about what the, the um, Kansas Suicide Prevention Resource Center is doing. Um, but Headquarters Counseling Center, which is our program that has answered uh, calls from people experiencing emotional distress or crises for over 50 years, um, has probably interacted with survivors of um, trafficking or domestic violence um, for since it began. Um, and as a crisis center that also answers the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, we come across folks from a variety of backgrounds and experiences who are dealing with some type of crisis. Um, and a crisis is ultimately whatever it is for that person or is self-defined. So, you know, really uh, suicide prevention intersects with all manners of, of life experiences. Um, and so, yeah, our, our, our programs are certainly a resource that's available to victims and survivors of trafficking. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, we talk about in, in relation to, to suicide in general or suicidal thoughts is that 
commonly if if a person is is feeling trapped um, or feeling like there is a lack of options, suicide could present itself as an option. And so if we think about common experiences around uh, human trafficking or any type of um, gender-based violence, a person is probably really likely to, to feel trapped. And so um, that's just kind of a simple example, I guess, of how suicide might, might intersect. And then we also know that the intersection is probably uh, one with lots of like lots Nuances. of different inter- yeah yeah um and there's lots of contributing factors for um how a person might get to a suicidal crisis mm-hmm. i think there are a lot of uh like shared risk factors too um if we think about some experiences that people have had as survivors of human trafficking um you know how drugs can be involved and we also know that when um substances are you know it are part of a person's life that can drastically increase their risk for suicide as well, whether those substances are, you know, chosen or forced, right? So um, I think there are a lot of just different, uh, yeah, complexities that that make um, these two issues closely related. And I also think about people who have had these experiences and have not been believed or can't get anything, um, any justice or, or anything done um, about that and how that can contribute to those feelings of, of being trapped and um, desperate really for, for some other option. Um, and so, you know, in, in terms of services, that, that means we have probably talked to a lot of people um, who on our hotline, which is a 24 um, seven free and confidential uh, hotline that anyone can call at any time. You want to um, give us that number, just uh, Erica, just so people have it? Yeah, so I'll give you two numbers. Um, okay. Our local line is uh, 785-841-2345. And um, then we also answer the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. And we answer that for the state of Kansas. So if anyone has a Kansas area code, um, there's a good chance that your call is gonna come to us. Um, oh, I also, and then, oh, go ahead. I'm, uh, you might be getting ready to say this, but I think um, the work that specifically you and the resource center does around uh, training providers, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, so we do a lot of like direct service uh, or, or interactions with people who are at risk or people who are struggling. Um, but then we also have this other program called the Kansas Suicide Prevention Resource Center, which is the side that I work on now, um, where we um, provide training across the state uh, for really anyone, but often it's, it's about, it's like service providers, whether they're therapists or advocates or whatever their role is in the community um, in supporting folks who have some of these uh, gender-based violence experiences or really just any other mental health um, related, uh, concern. Uh, we train them on, you know, being able to identify people who might be at risk for suicide, uh, screen folks for, for their level of risk and, and what to do when they have identified someone. So, um, lots of like how to support someone who's thinking about suicide, um, which I think there's a lot of crossover, uh, between the the two issues when you're talking with someone who's thinking about suicide, but also um, talking with someone who has been trafficked. Um, I think there's a lot of of similarities in the way that we support those folks. Um, So that's kind of an overview of most of what we do. There's there's a lot. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I really, really appreciate that. And if anything else comes up like throughout the course of that, conversation feel free to or if you remember anything feel free to, to just kind of stop and and let us know because we really do want to get a sense of you know the, the 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 breadth of your program I think you all are a lot like us and that people kind of look at you as one thing the, the call yep. center um but you have so many other programs you know people look at us as the shelter but we have yep. so many other programs as well so I, I really hope we can highlight some of those as we continue through the conversation for sure yeah um so uh, you know, uh, a lot of times we try to kind of bring this uh, in, into um, uh, give people some information, some tips, to let them know, 
kind of what what we when you go out and give presentations, what kind of um, uh, tips and 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 uh, help and and ideas you're giving to members of the community. If uh, there's a situation in which someone uh, is experiencing a mental health crisis, um, what are the best ways to help someone in that position? It's a good question. Um, Jared, you want to go? Sure. Um, one of the one of the things that I, I guess kind of simplifies the support that we provide is is um, ultimately it, it's important to listen. Um, it's important to hear. Uh, the feelings that person's experiencing. And um, if you get an inclination or if a person is um, presenting with warning signs that they might be thinking about suicide, um, if they're talking about suicide specifically, it's really important to ask directly, are you thinking about suicide? Um, that's specific to suicide. And so I guess distinguishing between suicide and a mental health crisis, no matter what, if you ask about suicide, it's really a no harm question you know if, if the person says yes then um, you can kind of move through what support looks like and how to support them in staying safe and if the answer is no then you can talk about whatever it is that it that's causing them some distress or or is related to their mental health concern so um, above all listening and asking the question is kind of the entry point into to supporting something to, to supporting someone and then ultimately um, getting them connected to a support that's comfortable for them, whether that's calling the crisis line, whether that's seeing a therapist, um, and depending on the severity of what they're experiencing, um, getting them the right care in the right moment. Um, if they're in a situation where uh, they, I, I'm wondering, do you work a little bit like the willow that you, you do need the person who's experiencing the crisis to call, but somebody else can call with them or can somebody call on behalf of someone experiencing crisis? How does that work? Yeah, we, um, we get calls from a lot of people. Um, we, it's, I think it's a little bit different than maybe what you all are um, used to at the Willow, just because um, there are times where we might cold call someone if, uh, if someone like someone that cares about that person calls us and is like, Hey, I'm really worried about my friend. I don't know what to do. Um, and you know, we talk, okay. You know, we, we talk about that and, and eventually we get to a place where we're talking about options. And one of the options that we do provide is that we would be willing to call that person, but we have no idea if they'll answer. Um, but in those cases, we also want to make sure that that would be a safe option for that person. Um, so, you know, if, if they're in, uh, you know, any situation where it might not be safe to give them a phone call, um, we, we, that's not an option then. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we get calls from people who are telling us, hey, I'm suicidal, I need help, um, or I just need to talk about it, or I've had a bad day and I need to talk about it. Maybe they're not suicidal, but then also we get calls from folks who um, are just worried about someone they care about and um, sometimes we get calls where the support person is calling with the suicidal person. Um, so it looks different all the time. I, I think to add on to that, um, a common misconception is that you can only call us if, if you're suicidal. Um, and in an ideal world, uh, people feel comfortable calling us before they reach that point where things are in immediate crisis right now and uh, we want to be there to listen and provide support before things kind of spill over so to speak um and because we wh what we know is that having someone provide non-judgmental and empathetic support can really reduce a person's stress level it can give them it, it presents them with the opportunity to gain clarity over their circumstances um and we we really work hard to make sure that that the support that is provided is non-judgmental. You know, we, we work hard to, to train counselors to set aside their own personal biases so that they can support person people from all walks of life, regardless of their belief or value system. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we, we really highly encourage people to call before they reach that point of crisis. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to take a moment to remind everyone that uh, we are here with KSBHQ uh, right now um, having a Monday Meets conversation. This conversation is open and we encourage your comments and reactions. You can feel free to leave those in the comments section. 
Um, if you don't feel comfortable leaving them in the comments section, you can email me at waverill at willowdvcenter.org and I'll get it worked into the conversation. Um, that email is down in the, in the comments as well. Um, and if you need to contact the Willow, you can do so at 785-843-3333. And KSPHQ, you can contact locally at 785-841-2345. And the national hotline is 1-800-273-8625. 8255. 8255. I got an extra six in there. 8255. <laughs> All right. 273-8255. So thank you so much um, for uh, joining us. Now, we, we're going to move on a little bit. We talked a bit before um, we actually started today's broadcast and you had both mentioned that while you were aware of the human tra trafficking task force um it was currently a different um person who was who was working with it so um let's just kind of talk about rather than the general the specifics of what's happening in the task force um what benefits do you all see to having um ksp hq involved with the task force and um how how does that what what, what do they bring back from those meetings? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think that there are, I mean, I think there are a lot of benefits, but the one that comes to mind uh, automatically for me is just the opportunity to like get some continuing education um, around what, like how, how might a human trafficking survivor present um, themselves? What might be some of the, the, the situations that they're facing or experiences that they've had? And how can we support those folks? Um, so I think it, it, it by, by sending someone um, from KSPHQ to be on the task force, it helps us stay aware of any updates that are happening locally, um, but then also just the issue itself, being able to continue to educate ourselves and then you know bring that back to KSPHQ so that we can educate our volunteers who are answering the phone um, and, and, and supporting trafficking survivors. So, um, I think one of the things that's hard is that we don't always know if someone is a trafficking survivor unless they identify that themselves. Um, and so we've probably talked to a lot of folks who have had this experience, but um, we might not have known that that's something that they, that that was a part of their experience unless they self-disclose. Um, so I think just being prepared uh, to be able to, to respond to those kinds of calls if we get them or when we get them um, is the main, the main benefit that comes to mind for me. And then I think the benefit um, maybe that, that we provide is some of that um, knowledge and expertise around uh, suicide and crisis care. Um, you know, back to kind of what we talked about at the top of the conversation, the fact that um, human trafficking survivors are at an increased risk for suicidal thoughts and suicide behaviors. Um, mm -hmm. We can bring some of that, that knowledge around what, what um, safe and um, evidence-based care looks like for suicide specifically um, and what that what that might look like in different settings whether it's in a, a hospital setting or what, whether it's in a um, like a clinical setting or a shelter setting so yeah that's a good point I, I think uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned uh, Erica um, just to, to tag back to what you said a little bit um, one thing that's come up time and time and time and time again uh, in the course of these human trafficking awareness month conversations is um, the awareness by the person who is experiencing trafficking that they are being trafficked is sometimes um, first of all, it's difficult to pinpoint because you know we 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 do screen for trafficking once people come into intake, but we don't directly um, mm -hmm. we will ask, but people may not consider um, what they're doing to right. be quote unquote trafficking, especially in situations like survival sex, it may be considered mm -hmm. just kind of getting by rather than they consider themselves being being trafficked. So yeah. it creates a real difficult uh, barrier to all services, uh, I would right. imagine, um, when when they when when folks are either not aware or not defining themselves as um, currently being trafficked. So that is something I think a right. lot of the other folks have, have mentioned as well. Thought it was an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it can be, it can be really hard, um, and it makes sense, right? It makes sense that people don't always know how to define their experience or or aren't there yet with how they are defining their experience, um, and we would never want to like force that onto them. Um, but I, I I just based on my past like work experience, um, 
because I was an advocate and a therapist at the care center. So I did work with some, uh, some folks who had been trafficked and um, I think it, it just, it, it makes sense for us to like be um, educated and aware of some of the things that could come up on the phones um, because, you know, we talked about like supporting people when they call. And um, I think one of the biggest things is that we, we have some awareness of uh, no matter how this person is defining their experience of what their options are. Um, and that we're able to like, let them know, Hey, these are the options that you have. What, what feels most empowering to you? What decision or what is the thing that you feel like you need the most and being able to empower them and, and have some control over their circumstance in that way. Great. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know what challenges you see from your work um, on the hotline um, that are, are there any challenges which seem specific to trafficking survivors? You know, you kind of, you touched on that a little, you've done work at the care center with survivor, with trafficking survivors. And at the Willow, we do have definitely, there are slightly, um, there, there, there's some things that you, that are less effective with trafficking survivors than they are with DV survivors and some things that are more effective. Um, what are the challenges that you find with um, serving trafficking survivors uh, at the hotline? I mean, I think like circumstances, right? Like we can support someone in an emotional crisis. We can talk about internal coping skills and, and what can help them feel soothed or calmed right there, but we can't get them out of a situation if that's what they want, right? Like, I think it's about like, what options do they have? What does feel safe to them? And uh, sometimes we can't deliver those things. And I think that's what's hardest for, at least for, for me and in, in working with folks is like feeling helpless. Like, uh, what, what can I do <laughs> um, right now that would be safe for you um, that, that, you know, we have control over. So I think there's, there's a lot of that for me that comes up. And I, I think too, Eric and I had talked about this prior, but um, one of the things that I think was imparted on me during my time at the Willow was that it's incredibly important to uh, place survivors at the center of the care that they're receiving and make sure that they have power and control over the decisions that they're, they're making. And I think um, when working with a human trafficking survivor, there's, there's that desire to, to help and kind of this touches on what Erica was just saying, but you want to provide as much as you can to, to help them. Um, and there are legitimate and real barriers that um, can get in the way of a person accessing the support or safety that they're, that they're trying to seek. So um, we, we really try hard um, to, to embody that same approach that we put people um, in the driver's seat and uh, we want to support their autonomy to make decisions that are best for them in the moment. Yeah, and, and that they know are safest for them because we don't ever assume that we know what's best for another person or um, that we know what's safest for another person. Um, and I think that that's one of the most important parts of what we do and also something that can be challenging. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Great, well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I, I think that's a... That's really, really an important, important point is, you know, not only just believing survivors in any situation, but also empowering them to make those decisions. And it, mm -hmm. it is a huge challenge with, with trafficking survivors who may not be, whose lives are intentionally kind of kept by their abusers and traffickers in a state of, of you know, constant crisis to have that time mm -hmm. and that space to, to try to un unwrap some of that can be uh, extraordinarily challenging. Something else that comes to mind as, as you were talking just now um, is that, you know, one of the things that we do on the hotline is, is we, especially when someone has expressed suicidal ideation, we tend to offer follow-up calls and that can be particularly challenging for a trafficking survivor or a domestic violence um, survivor too, um, because we can't, we can't offer a follow-up call um, and assume that that's going to be safe. You know, we ask a lot of safety questions, but um, I think that can often, like, we aren't able to follow up very often with folks in those situations because it's not safe for them. Um, they have to be able to call us when it's safe for them. And, and we would never want to jeopardize um, 
or get them in trouble or, you know, anything like that by calling. That uh, that makes a, a, a lot of sense. It's it's a it's a difficult line, um, and you don't want to put some, somebody potentially at risk. Yeah. Um, what would you like to? Uh, I, the, the question I've been asking most of the organizations is, what would you like to see the Human Trafficking Task Force do moving forward? Uh, I'm going to broaden this one out a little bit and say, what would you like to see? Sort of um, awareness raising within the community about issues related to human trafficking and um, and and your you know and, and suicide prevention. Um, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm a big, like, big time nerd when it comes to just like education and awareness. And so uh, I would love for there to be more information on the intersection of human trafficking and suicidality. Um, I would also love for, you know, in a perfect world, we would all be trained as advocates um, who are also on the hotline, you know, who like yeah. really under, I mean, I think we do a really good job of training um, hotline volunteers, but there's just so much to learn about those nuances, right? And um, I think it would be really cool to have some more education around um, what are the options when it comes to su supporting um, trafficking survivors and and what are the best ways to help um, in any time we come across someone who um, is thinking about suicide and also has this experience. I think since Erica kind of took the education and awareness level, which I, I would also um, support, <laughs> I, I think I'll take the, the broader level um, response because I, suicide prevention and human trafficking are, are both issues that are um, impacted by systems level and policy yes. decisions that um, are really important to focus on. And whatever we can do at our county or um, community level or state level to address human trafficking and suicide prevention, whether that's um, you know, working to improve people's economic circumstances um, or their access to care. Um, I think the, those things um, can be front of mind in addition to some of the things that happen on the more micro level or the more um, education and awareness level. Makes sense, I like that answer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming to join us today. Um, before we uh, shut it all down, I do like to give folks a little time to make shout outs or talk about anything that's going on in your organization that you kind of wanted to uh, let our folks know about, let people know about within the community. Uh, what's happening? What's next? Yeah. Uh, one thing that I do want to plug that we didn't mention as a part of our services is that uh, on the counseling center side, we do have um, a clinic where folks can access um, mental health services uh, for a suggested donation of $10, which obviously is not a requirement. Um, and those services are provided by um, master's level interns who are supervised by clinicians. Um, and so that those can be like weekly therapy sessions, for instance. Um, and so that is something that we do provide. Uh, we don't currently have a waiting list right now, which I think is important to know because oh, nice. a lot of people do um, have a waiting list right now. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to plug that. And, and if anyone uh, wants access to the clinic, um, I can provide my email address um, and you can put it in all the, the links and stuff if you want. Sounds um, great. And then Jared, I think you were gonna plug for volunteers and then I can say the other thing. Yeah, right Right now we are recruiting for volunteer counselors. So if anyone listening to this is interested in becoming a volunteer counselor, you can go to our website, which is ksphq.org. And I think the it's slash get involved. Um, and you can let us know that you're interested in becoming a volunteer. We did just wrap up our informational sessions. Um, but it may not be too late if you if you reach out to us. Um, and the process of becoming a volunteer counselor includes lots of training, uh, so you don't need any prior experience. Um, and uh, folks go through our, our training program with with other individuals, and it's a delightful experience. And it's so it's good. How, it's how Eric and I got our start, and and. Uh -huh. kind of and why we've stuck around. Um, there's a big community of volunteers um, here locally um, and all over the country really that have come through our, our training program and our counseling center. And then one other thing I'll mention is um, 
folks may be hearing about 988 in the news or um, in the media. And soon, as in in July, the lifeline will be transitioning to 988. And so people will call 988 instead of that 1-800 number that's hard to remember. Mm -hmm. um, we anticipate that will increase access. Um, and there's also some legislation at the state level that people can be aware of. Um, House Bill 2281 is um, in committee right now, and it it, it's proposing a mechanism for funding um, 988 and sustaining um, crisis services in Kansas. And so that's something to check out and be aware of and let your legislator know that you're um, in support of. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, like I said, uh, big time nerd about educating folks. Uh, I, I sent a link to our trainings and presentations page um, in the chat. So you can add that um, in the comments. Um, but we provide lots of trainings uh, through the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Um, that's a grant that, or that's, a, that's an agency that has been able to, to give us some money to be able to provide um, lots of, of education around suicide prevention and um, specifically that, uh, supports zero suicide, the zero suicide framework in Kansas um, for free. So um, lots of opportunities to uh, continue your education around suicide prevention and intervention. And most of those are being conducted virtually. So from the comfort of your yes. living room. <laughs> all right. And by most of those, Jared means all of those. <laughs> Although I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to being back in person with people yeah. again. It's, yeah. it's a, little, a little lonely in the old Zoom, Zoom, Zoomiverse. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for um, for meeting with us today. We really do appreciate it. Um, if anyone has any questions, just email myself or Erica. We'll be happy to get those answered for you. I'll put those questions, uh, those email addresses up in the comments of YouTube. Um, really do appreciate it, guys. And, and, and uh, thank you so much. It was great talking to you and uh, look forward to hearing more from you all soon. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Will. Thanks for having yeah. us. Thank have you. Have a great one. Thank you. Bye.